and welcome to this another edition of the Ancient Landmark. My name is Jared Jacobs, and I'm so glad to be with you and so appreciative of the fact that you've taken this time to spend uh, studying God's Word. I'm so thankful for the fact that you've tuned in and hope that as a result of our study together that we will be able to uh, be edifying, that we will be challenged, that we will uh, take the things that we're learning and use them and apply them to our lives. The Bible says in Romans 15 verse 4 that the things which are written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And certainly that's the case. We're talking about the book of Jonah, and we began a study in Jonah, and we want to continue in that, and certainly the things which were written aforetime, those things from the Old Testament, certainly uh, have a lot to teach us. And I'm sorry to say a lot of times the book of, of, well, any book of the Old Testament is ignored or is pushed to the side and as, as if it's not useful or is not needed. And I, I really wish that wasn't the case. Because as you look into the scriptures, the Old Testament has a purpose. The Old Testament teaches us so much. And while I recognize that Jesus Christ died upon the cross and through his death and through his shed blood, he ushered in a New Testament, a new covenant under which we live today. Still this Old Covenant, still this Old Testament has much to teach us. And though it's not a law, though it is not something that you would find as being binding on us in that sense of a law, there are many examples and many good lessons to learn and many life lessons and many things like that that are worthy of our study and worthy of our use and our emulation. And so it is with the book of Jonah. And we, like I said, we started in the book of Jonah, and I want to continue in our study. In Jonah chapter 1, we learned here how that God had spoken to Jonah. In chapter 1, verse 1, that God had spoken to Jonah and told him to go to the city of Nineveh and there to preach to those people, cry out against them because of their wickedness. But Jonah, instead of going and doing what the Lord said, hopped a freighter and went to Tarshish, was trying to go to Tarshish, and that is modern-day Spain. So he is trying to go the exact opposite direction as what God had sent him. And folks, that's what happens. When you're in sin, you will go the opposite direction that God wants you to go. In Matthew chapter 7, and verse uh, well, verse 13 and 14, he said, And you're in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. When you think about the wide way and the narrow way, these two ways are the two ways that you can go. You can go the wide and the broad way that leads to destruction, or you can go the straight and the narrow way that leads to life. These paths go opposite directions. They're not two parallel paths kind of going meandering together. It's not two, two roads kind of parallel to one another. They're going completely opposite directions. If you go on one, you're not going to be going on the other. You're not going to go and, and somehow be close by or whatever. You've got to understand one's leading to destruction and one then is leading to life. And so here is Jonah who, when he jumps on that ship, he is going the opposite direction of the way he needs to go, literally as well as spiritually. And there's nothing good that's going to come from this. And so uh, we find in Jonah chapter 1, he's trying to flee from God's presence and that's just not going to happen. But he's on the boat now and he's headed across the Mediterranean Sea and headed to Spain, basically. And the Bible says in Jonah 1 and verse 4 that the Lord sent a great wind uh, here to the sea and there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was like to be broken. A terrible, horrible storm and just tossed and to and fro and, and all of this and, and the waves crashing and so forth and the people were scared. You go on, the mariners, verse 5, the mariners were afraid. Now that gets my attention right there because the mariners, those are the folks that are used to being on the ship and they're used to seeing storms and they're used to seeing the hard winds and the bad winds and all of that. They're used to those kind of things and this storm scares them. That tells me how bad the storm was. And it says, They cried every man to his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship in the sea uh, to lighten it. But Jonah was gone down in the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise and call upon thy God, if so be that God will, not, will, will think upon us, so that we perish not. 
And it says, they said, uh, everyone to his fellow, come, let us cast lots that we may know what caused this evil upon us. And they cast lots and the lot fell upon Jonah. He said, and they said to him, tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? Why uh, have thou come? What's thy country and of what people art thou? And that down to verse number eight. So as we think here in Romans chapter, um, Jonah chapter one and verse four through eight, uh, we get into the action very quickly because once Jonah decides to leave and he heads out, the Bible says there's a great storm, so much that the mariners are afraid and they cried out and they cast forth their wares and so forth trying to figure out what was going on and here was Jonah in the ship fast asleep. Can you imagine that? He's in the ship fast asleep. How could you be asleep in a storm like this? In fact, that's what they ask him. How in the world could you be asleep? That's what it means. What meanest thou, O sleeper? Jonah 1, verse 6. What do you mean, O sleeper? In other words, how can you be asleep? How could you have any inkling of trying to rest in a storm like this? And, you know, if you think about it, that goes on today. We think about this. There's people that are in sin. There's people that are that are doing what is wrong, and they're asleep. I'm sorry to say, though I have to say it, I'm sorry to say that there are people today who claim to be Christians, and they are asleep spiritually. They are asleep at the wheel. And the Bible talks about this, in fact, in Romans chapter 13. And here's the Apostle Paul in Romans 13 telling folks, telling Roman Christians, telling them it is high time that you awoke out of your sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. It is high time to wake up. And folks, listen to me. It's high time you woke up. You look around today and we see uh, all the problems and see all the issues and difficulties that's going on. And so many of them are man-made. In other words, you did, we did it to ourselves. But part of the problem is you have people who are supposed to be godly people, who are supposed to be Christians, who are supposed to be serving God, who are supposed to be faithful to him, and they are asleep. And they're not speaking out. They're not crying out. They're not saying anything against the sin and the wickedness and ungodliness that's going on. And they say nothing about it. They do nothing about it. They have no action. They they don't do any. They just stand back just like they're asleep. And then wonder why we're in the shape we're in. This is the problem. And so when here's something that, that even these mariners understood. You know, you're in a situation where, uh, as it were, even the even the worldly people. Now, they these people are calling out to false gods and and idols and such. Even the worldly people saw something that Jonah, a godly man, never saw. He was asleep. They saw it. They were aware of it. What in the world are you doing? What do you mean, O sleeper? Why are you not awake? Why do you not care? Uh, if we if we think for a moment, Jesus had a similar thing happen to him whenever he was on the on the sea. And you remember, he also was asleep on the boat. But I suggest to you, Jesus was asleep on the boat for an entirely different reason. Christ had said, whenever they got on that boat after feeding the five thousand, and they got on the boat, and they said, "Let us go to the other side." And when he said, "Let us go to the other side," that was basically the a command right there. That was a statement of fact. We're going to go to the other side, and it doesn't matter what happens between here and there. We're going, and that's why he got after his apostles. He said, "What? What are you? You know, you you men of little faith." He was upset with them. You say, "Well, how could they be upset and call them men of little faith?" It's because they didn't believe Jesus when he said, "Let's go to the other side." That's a little different case than Jonah here. Because Jesus, of course, committed no sin, and he had said, let's go, and those folks needed to believe they were going to make it because Christ said they were. In this case, you have a storm coming up and a storm beating on because of Jonah's sin, and he's going to make that clear in just a moment. Here is Jonah's sin. And when Jonah here is asleep, he shouldn't have been asleep. 
He should have been up. He should have been terrified. He should have been upset about this because it's his sin that brought this about. And folks, it's the same way today. We need to be upset. We need to be worried. We need to be scared to death when we think about the sins we've committed in our lives and the mess that it makes in our lives. And we shouldn't be asleep. We shouldn't be at ease. We shouldn't be at rest. It shouldn't be something that that gives us no pause. It is something that ought to upset us and scare us to death and let us stop at nothing until we're right with God again. That's what Jonah needed to do, but he didn't. Friends, listen to me. Don't follow the, the example of Jonah here. We need to stop at nothing till we have come to the Lord and we're right in his sight and the Lord can calm the storm. And the Lord can make it so that that you are at ease and that your guilt is taken away. And he can make it so that you are forgiven and you are right in the sight of God. That is absolutely what the Lord can do. You look in your New Testament and you'll read about folks who, though they had been guilty of killing Jesus, though they had been guilty of killing other people, though they had been guilty of drunkenness and murders and sorceries and whoremongers and and fornication and homosexuality and all kinds of wickedness and lying and and thievery and, and on and on and on. All the things that people have been guilty of as as, uh, described to us in the New Testament from Acts chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Galatians chapter 5, and on and on and on. What we find is there is salvation in Christ. Not to go to sleep, Not to just let this pass by, not to have this idea that, well, time will take care of it. Listen, time won't heal this one. Sometimes people say time heals all wounds. Well, time heals a lot of things, but not this. There's not enough time in the world to forgive you of your sin. You need to come to the Lord believing that Jesus is the Son of God to repent of your sins and confess your faith in Him and be baptized for the remission of your sins. You need to do that as do I. And whenever we become a Christian, then you can talk about your sins being forgiven or washed away, Acts 22, 16, to have your transgressions forgiven, Colossians 2, verse 13, and to be right in the sight of God. That's what it takes. Don't go to sleep on this one, folks. Don't go to sleep. Don't rest. Don't stop. Don't don't slack. Don't let up. Don't quit. Don't stop moving until you get right back to Christ and get your life right with him. See, that was the problem here. These folks recognized. The mariners even recognized, man, this is a mess. What's wrong with you, Jonah? And Jonah laid there fast asleep like everything was okay. Oh, isn't that terrible? And that's what happens to us. Sin will do that to you. Sin will blind us. Sin will lull us to sleep. And that's exactly what happened here with Jonah. And he was wrong for being in that condition. And you go on and these people said they were afraid. They understood something was wrong. And they cried out to their God. But I want to bring up something else, by the way, as we're talking about this Jonah 1 verse 5. I want to bring up another thing that sometimes people don't realize and maybe don't think about or talk about enough. And that is that whenever I sin... Whenever I sin, my sins affect other people. My sin affects others. And it's not a matter of just, well, I'm going to commit so-and-so sin, whatever it is, whatever my favorite sin is, whatever my pet sin is. I'm going to commit this and no one will ever be the wiser. No one will ever know about it. Nobody ever learn. Wrong. Whenever you sin, it affects you and it affects others as well. And a prime example is right here. In the book of Jonah... Here, his sin has affected a boat full of strangers. All those mariners are are rushing around, and they're throwing things overboard, and they're lashing things down, and tying things down, and using all their expertise to try to keep this boat afloat, and they're running around like crazy folks all the time, and, and Jonah's asleep, and it's Jonah's fault. Think about that. Whenever Jonah hopped on that ship, do you think that was his intention to say, you know what, I'm going to just stir up a bunch of people and just really ruin some people's days? Is that what he was doing? Of course not. He wasn't about that at all. That wasn't what he was trying to do. Yet his sin hurt other people and other people he didn't even think about. Not to mention the fact that it's, and we haven't even talked about those yet, that all this time he's away from Nineveh, he is affecting Nineveh because he should be over there preaching to those folks and telling them the truth. He should be helping them and preaching to them and teaching them the truth, and he's ignored that the whole time. And so those folks in Nineveh, their souls are in jeopardy because Jonah's not there to preach to them, 
And then at the same time, he's jeopardizing a whole bunch of other people because he's in sin and with those folks that he shouldn't have been with in the first place. You talk about a mess, that's what sin does to you. Sin makes a mess out of things. It makes a royal mess out of it. But keep on reading. It says, what did those mariners do? Those mariners took the wares. That means the goods. That means the cargo and the things like that. And they were pitching that over overboard. Why do that? Well, they're throwing it overboard in the hopes of lightening the boat to keep it afloat. They don't want it to sink. And the waves are crashing and the wind's blowing and no doubt this boat's just toppling back and forth and all this. And so they're trying to throw stuff overboard to lighten the load the best way they can. Now, you say, okay, what, what do you mean? Well, think about it. Where did that load come from? It came from Joppa. Where was it going? It was going to Spain. What happened in Spain? Well, evidently, somebody in Spain had ordered, if you will, had requested, had ordered something that came from Joppa. And they had some things that they wanted and they bought or purchased and it was going on that cargo ship from Joppa over to Tarshish and it will never make it. They had stuff there that they will never see. There was stuff whenever that boat does get there, and, and of course we jump ahead in Jonah 1, and they do make it. I mean, the sea, the, the sea is calmed and everything's fine now. But they go on, they don't have the stuff anymore. They don't have anything. It's gone. Now what? I mean, was you think that was Jonah's plan in the beginning? Jonah said, you know what? I'm going to figure out a way that I can you know, really mess up some sailors and really really play with their brains and have them run around like chickens with their head cut off. And not only that, I'm going to figure out a way to ruin, ruin some people's days that's over there in Spain and a bunch of people I'd never met before. You think that's what he intended? Of course not. He wasn't thinking that far ahead. Whenever you're in sin, you don't think that far ahead. You don't think, hmm, what are the consequences of my sin and how will that affect other people? Sin, by its very nature, is selfish. And so whenever I'm, I sin, sin is a result of me yielding to my temptations. James chapter 1 says this. And James chapter 1, verse 14 to 15 says, Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And that lust when it hath conceived bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. James 1, 14 and 15. So if I sin and it's a result of my temptations, I, I was tempted, and I gave in to my temptations. Is that not the very definition of selfishness? I want to do that. I, there's, a, there's a temptation to sin out here, and I want to do it. I'm going to go do it. I'm going to live that. I'm going to enjoy it because it's going to make me happy. That's all selfishness. And whenever I do those things and I commit that sin, I'm not worried about what other people think. I'm not worried about how it affects other people. I'm not worried about how it touches other people's lives. I might be later, but at that point, I'm not worried about it. All I'm worried about is satisfying a lust. Now, here's Jonah. All he's worried about is satisfying a lust. All he's worried about is satisfying his desire that says, I don't want to go to Nineveh. I don't want to go there. And more on that in chapter 4. But I don't want to go there. I don't want to be there. I don't want to be around those people. I'm not going to do it. I don't care what the Lord says. And so off he goes. And now he's messed up the lives of no telling how many hundreds of people at least dozens, but maybe even hundreds of people, if you think about whatever cargo was on its way to Spain, he's messed up the lives and messed up the fortunes of no town how many people just because he didn't want to do what the Lord said. Don't tell me that sin does not harm other people. It does. Don't tell me that sin doesn't affect your life. It does. And here in a moment, I'm going to tell you someone else that it, that sin affects that maybe we don't think about all the time. Before I do, let me remind you, this program is brought to you by the Caneyville Church of Christ. The Caneyville Church of Christ meets together on the Lord's Day at 10 a.m. for Bible study. We have Bible study Wednesday night at 7. And we'd love to see you. You'd be our honored guest if you come and be with us at any and every time that you can. We'd love for you to come. We'd love for you to visit. We'd love for you to bring an open Bible and bring an open mind as we study and learn God's Word together. 
And furthermore, as we think about uh, following God's word, make sure and come be with us. We meet right across the road from the Sacramento Bank. They're near the intersection of Highway 62 and Highway 79 in Caneyville in Grayson County. We'd love to see you. And we'd love for you to come and ask your Bible questions. Come see what we do and what we're about and why we do what we do. We would love for that to happen. And you know that you're our honored guest whenever you come and visit with us at any time. You can call me if you'd like, 589-4167. You can call me. You can text me. I ask for better directions than what I'm giving you right now. And you can get those. And I'll give you directions from your driveway all the way to the parking lot. And uh, we would love for you to come. And if you have any Bible questions, call me on this subject of Jonah or any other Bible-related question. Call me, 589-4167. You can call. You can text. We can set up a Bible study time, and we can just sit down and study God's Word together. If you'd like to have a Bible correspondence course, we can set that up as well. And Bible correspondence courses are absolutely free, and you can you can be uh, belong to that, and you can join with others that are taking part in those correspondence courses. Uh, in addition to that, you can go to our Facebook page. Just look up Caneyville Church of Christ on Facebook. Like us. Follow us there. You can send us messages. You can write us notes, whatever you'd like. Or go to our website, CaneyvilleChurchofChrist.com. And again, you, there's, you have access to all kinds of Bible study material and all kinds of things we strive to update several times in the week. And even at that, you can still... Uh, Send us an email, send us a message, whatever you'd like to do. But just know all of that is available to you, and we would love to talk to you and love to study with you and talk to you about things with spiritual nature, that we need to get our lives right with God. And, and I hope that you see this as we're studying right now, the horrible effects of sin. This is just one passage we can talk about. There's many that talk about how awful and horrible sin is, but I want you to see... Here in Jonah chapter 1, just the section we're looking at now, how that sin affects so many people's lives. And I told you there's, there's some that maybe we don't talk about enough, but I want you to understand something else, that my sin, your sin, our sin affects heaven itself. And we talk about how sin affects men and, and this specific example in Jonah chapter 1 and how this is. But folks, listen. Sin affects heaven itself. You say, well, I don't know about that. I don't know how that could be. Think about it. What did God have to do in order to forgive men of sin? What did Jesus have to do in order to forgive men of sin? He had to go and Jesus had to what? Die on the cross. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, didn't he? And so here's God giving his son, here is Jesus Christ giving his life, shedding his blood. Why? Matthew 26, 28. For the remission of sins. That means for the forgiveness of sins. For the remission of sins. And so whenever I start putting those things together, then I see just how real my sin is and how my sin affects me. It affects other people. Sin affects heaven itself. Is there any wonder why the Bible spends so much time talking about how to get out of sin and to stay out of it? Here's Jonah, and Jonah's sin has affected God. He's affected his fellow man. He's affected strangers. He's affected people he'll never meet. Isn't that amazing? Those people in Spain, he's never going to meet those folks. Why should he care about them? Well, just because it's because of him that all their stuff got thrown overboard. And there's going to be a bunch of disappointed people in Spain wondering what happened when this boat shows up. What happened to my stuff? I paid good money for that. What happened to those things? This may very well may have been some folks' livelihood. I mean, I don't know what was on that ship. And besides that, they threw off other things. They probably threw off their food too. Because whenever you get real desperate, and you're on a boat and trying to lighten the load, you get that desperate, you'll throw the food off too. And so here Jonah is. And they said, uh, the lot fell upon Jonah, and they said, Tell us, what is thine occupation? This is Jonah 1, verse 8. What is thy occupation? He says, uh, what, uh, For whose cause this evil is upon us? Whose fault is this? What have you done? See, what is your occupation? What do you do? Uh, where have you come from? What's your country? Of what people are you? Jonah evidently hadn't tell, told them much of anything. Uh, might have told them a few things because he, he'll go on and say that he fled from the presence of the Lord, verse 10. He had told them about that. 
that he'd fled from the presence of the Lord. But evidently he didn't tell him too much because he needed to tell him, verse 9, I'm a Hebrew and I fear the Lord God of heaven, which made the sea and the dry ground. Well, I don't know about it. I, I, I wonder sometimes because he sure wasn't acting like somebody that feared God. Not here. He says, I fear the God, Lord God of, of heaven. The people were exceedingly afraid and they said, verse 10, why have you done this? Why have you done this? And friends, while we're thinking about sin and we're thinking about wickedness and evil, that comes to our minds so often. You look around and there's a school shooting and people invariably will say, why have you done it? Why did this happen? And there'll be uh, some horrible tragedy and there'll be people say, why did this happen? Why have you done it? Why has this gone on? And even uh, with sin in our lives, and people may ask you that, and maybe, uh, you know, like I said, it may not be killings and murders. It didn't have to go to that extreme. But anytime somebody sins, and, and why have you done that? And I'm going to tell you something, folks. There's going to be a day coming when we'll stand before God in judgment. And Romans chapter 2 talks about standing before God in judgment, just like Matthew 25 does in other places. And folks, you're going to answer for that. And why have you done it? What sin is there that's worth going to hell for? Think about that. What sin is there that's worth missing heaven over? What is it? And folks, at the end of the day, that's the kind of question you're going to have to answer. Why have you done this? Why did you do it? Why did you live that way? Why have you conducted yourself in that way? Why would you put other people in jeopardy like you've done? Why? Why? And there's really no good answer for that except to say, because I wanted to, because that's the end result of sin, isn't it? Sin at its base, as its base, as its most basic form, is selfishness. Why'd you do that? Because I wanted to. And that's just a horrible answer. You mean you have no more uh, thought or care about a about your fellow man than that? You mean you don't love your fellow man and you just say, well, I just did because I wanted to? Isn't that horrible? And that's where Jonah is at this point. Jonah needs forgiveness, and perhaps it is that there's folks right now, you need forgiveness as well. And maybe the things you're committing and things you've done, you go back and you say, you know, I'm doing this because I want to. That's a problem. That is a huge problem. And it's something we cannot uh, afford to just let go. We can't afford to just leave that and say, well, ho-hum, you know, you can't do that. We can't say, uh, be so cavalier about it. We've got to be serious about it. And that means coming back to God. We're going to see, and, and uh, we're going to keep on in Jonah chapter 1, but we're going to see the changes that Jonah has to make finally in his repentance. But I'm telling you right now that you need to repent of your sins. You you're, are far away from God and you've turned away from God and you're not living as you should. You need to come back to Him. You need to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You need to repent of your sins. You need to confess your faith in Him and be baptized for the remission of your sins. You need to do that and do it without delay. All through the New Testament, when folks were going to become Christians, the emphasis was upon now, upon right now, to do it now. Even in Hebrews chapter 3, and verses 7 and 8, he says, Today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your heart. Let's remember that. It means today. It means now. It means without delay. And friends, if I can help you in any way to come to the Lord, to do what the Lord says, to follow in his plan of salvation, as is described from Acts chapter 2 through Acts chapter 19, please let me know. Please call me. You can call me. You can text me. Uh, you can contact me through our, our website and send an email or anything like that you prefer. And let's talk about God's word and let's get ourselves right before God. The sin you're committing is affecting other people. The sin you're committing has affected heaven itself. And it's time to come back to God. It's time to do what the Lord says and be what the Bible makes you and to do so without delay. And so if I can help in any way, let me know. Until next time, Lord willing, we bid you good day.